Well, four years ago, the longtime civil rights attorney Larry Krasner shocked the political establishment in Philadelphia by being elected district attorney. Krasner, who had sued the Philadelphia Police Department 75 times during his career, was suddenly the city's top prosecutor after running on a platform vowing to end mass incarceration. Larry Krasner is now <clears throat> up for re-election and is facing a former prosecutor who he fired in next week's Democratic primary. Krasner's unexpected 2017 victory in his effort to overhaul the DA's office is the focus of a new eight-part series on the PBS program Independent Lens. This is the trailer for the series. I rejected a long time ago that the only purpose of the criminal justice system is to punish. Voters in Philadelphia have chosen a progressive as their new district attorney. The most stunning upset. Sending political shockwaves across the country. I am a career civil rights lawyer, the only attorney in the history of this city to overturn 800 convictions by corrupt police officers. Krasner is a hero to some and a bum to others. He's never been pro-law enforcement. If things aren't working from the inside, we need to bring someone from the outside. What do you think he's trying to accomplish? Anarchy. At this point, there are more people of color in prison or on parole than in slavery at the end of the Civil War. Larry is bringing in criminologists, activists. Everything we do, steady fire, heavy resistance. This will be controversial. Policies that focus on rehabilitation and second chances as opposed to punishment. We're in Philadelphia, and there's murders and robberies. Community service is maybe not appropriate. This DA's office has been too close and too cozy with the fraternal order of police. How corrupt do you think the city is? Anybody who's dealt with this office knows there are secrets. We need to find out where the secrets are. you got to be kidding me. What is it? It's all about police officers. There has not been prosecution of police misconduct by this DA's office for 30 years. Right now, Philly police officers think the scales are suddenly weighed down in favor of criminals. If you're too corrupt to testify in court, you're too corrupt to patrol the streets. Who was DA when there were dozens of people shot over the weekend? I was. We're tired, and we want our neighborhood back! When you try to make the right decisions, I'll live with the rest. It's a meaningless, endless cycle, a cycle of trauma, a cycle of pain. Some of the effects can be irreversible. There's no mass incarceration. That's utterly ridiculous. Not one cop is going to tell you that he's on our team. Well, I suggest you don't shoot unarmed people in the back. The DA's office is not a place a social experiment should be conducted. You don't have to destroy the system to get the results you want. That's the trailer for the new eight-part independent lens series, Philly DA. The series was created by Ted Passan, Yanni Brook, and Nicole Salazar. Ted and Nicole join us now. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. This is an astounding eight-part series. Ted, can you talk about why you decided to take on uh, this project? Sure. Um, thanks again for having us. Um, yeah, I um, had been interested in criminal justice issues for a long time. Uh, different members of my family had been locked up at, at, at different times, and so it was something I was always interested in looking at. Um, I had heard Larry Krasner's name for many years. Um, he had represented a lot of friends of mine who were activists, but had never met him. And uh, one day a friend called and was like, hey, you know that guy Larry Krasner, he's running for district attorney. And it was said like, can you believe it? Isn't that hilarious? Isn't that ridiculous? And that's exactly what it felt like. It felt absurd. Never did I expect that he was actually going to win, but the campaign itself just seemed like a really great opportunity to talk about the role of the prosecutor, the role of the district attorney, and kind of assumptions that we've always made about what it was, and now thinking about what it could be in something that was totally different. And so it started out as, you know, the idea of like, oh, this might just be a short film about a stunt campaign. And then when he actually won, it was just like, oh, OK, well, the, <laughs> this story is suddenly a lot bigger. This is now a story about, like, are you actually going to be able to do any of this stuff? Um, is change possible in an institution like this? Why or why not? And uh, so suddenly it got a lot bigger, and that became the, the focus of what we thought was going to be a feature and then turned into a multi-part series. And, Ted, why, why do you think that uh, Krasner did win that initial campaign uh, that, and why his message resonated with 
Philadelphia voters. Could you talk, and also could you talk about when he came into office? Because now you're you uh, you're filming him in terms of the of the decisions he had to make as soon as he got into office to remake that uh, uh, that agency. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason that he um, attracted so much attention in the beginning and ended up bringing out, you know, a much larger voter turnout than we had had in 20 years prior, 50,000 more voters turned out in this election than had prior. I think it just shows the fact that, you know, the Philadelphia criminal justice system has just been notoriously punitive for many years. It was just the default. And I think a lot of people in Philadelphia really wanted that change and really wanted someone to be saying the things that he was saying on the campaign trail but just assumed it was never going to happen. I think a lot of people just kind of given up uh, in terms of uh, the the election for district attorney and just assumed that nobody was ever going to come and speak to the things that they wanted to hear, speak about reform in the way that they wanted. I think it just seemed impossible. And the fact that somebody was saying the things he was saying, um, I think just excited a lot of people who had kind of gotten out of the process uh, in a way or kind of given up. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what we're watching them do, you know, yeah, as, as you see in the series, you know, they really just kind of hit the ground running. You kind of got the sense from him and everybody in his team that they just could not believe that they were in the office and so that they were going to do as much as possible. It almost felt like there was this air of like, oh, we're going to be found out and someone's going to like get us out of here. So we better hurry up and just do as much as we can as quickly as we can. And um, so, you know, in the series, we kind of follow that and we see, you know, how we see how the power of the district attorney is is huge and has a ton of discretion. There's a lot the district attorney can do with absolutely no check on that power, but there are limits. And we kind of see Krasner and his team kind of run up against those limits um, in the series as well. I'd, I'd like to bring uh, Nicole into the conversation as well. This week's episode focuses on the issue of juvenile lifers. Uh, could you talk about the significance of that issue and what changes Larry Krasner ha has promised uh, uh, when it comes to that? Sure. Uh, good morning, Juan and Amy. It's great to be with you. Um, yeah, this week's episode looks at the issue of juvenile lifers, which basically is has to do with children who are incarcerated um, uh, for crimes they committed as children. And, and over the last you know 20 years or so, we've seen um, precedents come out of the Supreme Court uh, based around brain science involving, you know, the brains of, of young people not being as fully developed as adults, that they shouldn't be held to as punitive standards as adults, um, that their, you know, impulse control and sort of ability to consider consequences is is not as developed in that as adults. So for 20 years, we've sort of seen the Supreme Court move away from some of these, uh, you know, the most punitive punishments, including the death penalty, and up until recently, uh, the possibility of of life in prison without possibility of parole. And, you know, Philadelphia is really the has been the leader in the country in terms of sentencing children to life in prison without parole. Um, and uh, so Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania broadly and then Philadelphia specifically. And, you know, you see uh, in 2016, there was a, a Supreme Court decision that basically said, you know, not only can can children no longer be sentenced to life without possibility of parole, but uh, district attorney offices across the country actually have to resentence all the children who had been uh, already sentenced to that sentence. Um, and so you see, you know, slowly over the years, DA's offices, including in Philadelphia, starting to do resentencings of these uh, former cases. And basically what that means is, you know, the district attorneys have to revisit those cases, look at, you know, what kind of rehabilitation has happened over the course of, of the decades or years that that person may have been in prison, and offer a new sentence for the judge to review and accept or not accept. Um, and in, in Philadelphia, uh, the you know, Larry Krasner had committed to, on the campaign trail, sentencing uh, juvenile lifers to less time in prison than, than some of the sentences that you were seeing. You were seeing a lot of sort of de facto life in prison sentences, you know, a 60-year sentence or a 50-year sentence, those sorts of things were, were not uncommon. Um, and, uh, you know, between the sentences uh, from, from the prior DA, Seth Williams, and DA Krasner, you know, a study came out that said, uh, that their sentences were on average about 10 years less. Um, and so we follow in episode five, uh, which aired last night, the case of Ju uh, Joseph Chamberlain, um, who was uh, sentenced for the murder of Sultan uh, Ahmed uh, when he was 15 years old. And you see through the course of the episode, um, both you know Joseph having to go up against the parole board 
and sort of, you know, make his case um, to the parole board and the DA's office sort of considering his case and eventually his, you know, his release from prison. Um, and we also follow the family of, of, you know, the parents of the boy that he killed and sort of their, um, they're having to sort of grapple with revisiting that case and sort of deal with the consequences of, of his release. I want to go to a clip from Philly DA as the district attorney's team rolls out the new juvenile sentencing reform policies. The clip begins with Bob Listenby, Philadelphia's first assistant district attorney, who was brought into the office by DA Larry Krasner. When you have a different vision, sometimes it takes new leadership in order to implement that vision. And we've reached that point. I really need the opinion of a cross-section of folks that are in this room to really get the policies done right. I just don't want to have people who are stuck in this entrenched culture to silence everyone else who has come here to make a difference. Okay. We should figure out why kids are being sent to placement. What do you think makes the most sense? Overhaul of crossover court would really sort of dismantle some of the dysfunction that we see. It's bad. It's bad. And the young people end up God knows where. This is a map, the different locations where youth can be sent in the state of Pennsylvania. You might as well be sending some of these kids to Canada. Do you think we should use youth or child or juvenile? I think juvenile has become derogatory, but whatever word you use is going to become derogatory. We're at a point where we actually recommend our policies to the DA. We're not asking for random drug screens as a condition of probation unless there's a reason to believe that the child has a drug problem. The metaphor that I have found most useful is the idea of shrinking the footprint, making the system smaller and less damaging. The ADA should recommend an alternative to detention at the time of any new arrest. And avoid criminalizing normal, albeit unwanted, adolescent behavior. So how soon are we going to roll this out and scare everybody? That last voice, D.A. Larry Krasner. Uh, Nicole Salazar, if you can comment on this in the Supreme Court case. And finally, the critical issues that you felt that you're seeing not only uh, D.A. Larry Krasner deal with, but progressive D.A.s around the country. Sure. Yeah. One, one last thing that I, I, I should have mentioned previously is that just uh, last month, there was a new decision by the Supreme Court that basically— um, was a U-turn from all of those prior cases that I was mentioning that were, you know, limiting the punitive nature of, of sentencing for juvenile, um, for, for children convicted as juveniles. Um, and so now it's, you know, it's, while there are 25 states, I believe, that have outlawed uh, life without possibility of parole for juveniles, um, in all the other states, you know, that, that sort of pattern that we've been seeing of, of, of these cases being resentenced, all of that is now, um, you know, open for question. Those some of those some of those individuals very well might die in prison because of because of the new case um, that was ruled six three and and had the opinion written by Brett Kavanaugh uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the 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 clip that you just showed was sort of you know had had to do with other juvenile policies in the office and sort of what we track in the series is is not so much some of the specifics and the policies that they're putting forward, but actually you know the tensions between the new guard between uh, Krasner's team. And the existing prosecutors in the office, because, you know, what's part of what's so interesting about sort of trying to track institutional change is understanding that even even when you have a leadership uh, change like you did in Philadelphia, that was quite dramatic. Um, you know, this is an office of 600 people. There are 300 attorneys in the office. And while Krasner did fire, you know, 30 prosecutors when he came into office, there's still many people who had been, you know, part of the existing system who were doing their their work day in and day out, who know a lot of the details of the system, who are still in the office. Um, and so we really, you know, kind of used the debate and discussion around, you know, juvenile policies to sort of get at what that what that tension is and sort of how how different people coming from these different perspectives were sort of forced to kind of work together or not work together and sort of see how that unfolds.